Everyone quiet. Sounds like we have a visitor approaching. Hello, fellow traveler. You look tired. We're on a long road trip and stopped here to set up camp. You're welcome to rest here for the night. There's always room around our fire. So have a seat. The food's hot, the drinks are cold, the fire is warm, and the stories, hopefully, are scary. I'm Jeremy and I'm the driver on these road trips we take, but for the night, I'll be your storyteller. So settle in for some stories from the road. Tonight's story is called The Whistler's Highway. Come on, you're not serious. What? I am. It's clearly the fastest way to get to our campsite. But have you heard the stories? The deaths? The thing that lives there? Just stories. I have a friend who uses it every single week for his deliveries, and I just talked to him yesterday. But I switched the walkie-talkie off. There they go again, I signed to Gabby who was next to me. You can't blame him. Trust me, Brian's just thick-headed. Anything anyone says, he dismisses. Only thing you trust are his own thoughts. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. I just find it irritating, Gabby replied, gripping the wheel harder and glaring at the vehicle in front of her. Do you need me to switch it back on? I asked. No, I think that hearing plain silence is a million times better than hearing their incessant arguing. But you don't think... Gabby turned her head to look at me briefly and said, Relax. We'll switch it on later. After all, we don't want the lead car to bring us to some deserted area rather than the campsite we're supposed to go to, right? Right, I replied and leaned back on the leather seat of the car and looked behind at the back seat. As usual, our camping bags with all our supplies still sat on the back seat. Stop doing that. You're making me think someone's sitting behind us, Gabby complained. Sorry, lady. I muttered and turned my head to look at the front again. Just a few more hours, and we would reach the campsite where we would camp for the next few days. Brian said he was going to catch a deer. He's probably going to come back with some nuts and berries again, and Gabby would rage at him. And he probably won't listen to her again. Oh well, might as well catch some sleep. I thought as my eyelids dropped down, and I nodded off in complete silence. Wake up, sleepyhead. Gabby's voice pierced through my dream, and I sat up, still half asleep realizing that we had stopped. Through heavy eyelids, I could see Gabby along with Brian and Becky standing in front of some sign on the road. Groaning, I opened the car door and stepped out of the car. What's going on? I muttered sleepily. Brian rolled his eyes and remarked, Did you forget? Before you enter the Whistler's Highway, you must sign the agreement. Stepping forward and looking closely at the sign, I remembered. Oh, right, 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 I said hastily as I took out my marker and signed on the surface of the sign. The sign wasn't the prettiest thing I saw on the highway. The sign wasn't the prettiest thing I saw on the highway. Danger, you're entering the Whistler's Highway. By signing on this sign, you agree to the rules of the highway. Number one, don't travel on the highway in the night, otherwise the Whistler will get you. Don't travel alone, otherwise Whistler will get you. That was number two. Number three, don't, absolutely don't, get out of your vehicle while on the highway, otherwise the Whistler will definitely get you, was emblazoned in red on the sign with a space at the bottom where numerous signatures, including mine, Becky's, Gabby's, and Brian's signatures, were marked on the surface, with some crossed out for no particular reason. The entire sign looked like it was about to fall off as it was as it was very carefully balanced on the post holding it up. Boy, this Whistler guy seems like a fun guy. Half of me thought to myself while the other... <clears throat> let me do that again, sorry. Boy, this Whistler guy seems like a fun guy to meet. Half of me thought to myself while the other half still felt a bit unsettled by the get you part. Becky also seemed to share my thoughts as she stared upwards, worried, were upwards worriedly at the sky, which was visibly turning darker. Are you sure we're safe when we go on this highway? I mean, it's almost nighttime, and the sign clearly said, she stammered. Don't worry. 
The Whistler's just an urban legend, and I doubt he would be mad if we broke one of his precious rules. Brian interrupted confidently. Looking at the three people around him, he remarked, Now come on. Let's get a move on. I don't intend to sleep in the car. He'd already opened the car door and was now waiting for us in the car. The three of us sighed and moved towards our respective cars. The car started up and began to trundle down the Whistler's Highway. Looking at the empty desert along the highway, I couldn't shake the feeling that we'd made a mistake and that we were in grave danger. Still feeling scared, I tilted my head and looked up at the sky. It was indeed getting dark. After staring at the desert sky for about an hour or so, I began to notice something strange. Notably, the dark black sky had turned purple. Now, I don't know much about weather and sky colors and all that, but I knew that the sky shouldn't be purple at what was close to 9 p.m., as my watch helpfully indicated. I tried to mention this to Gabby, but she looked noticeably distracted and her foot was continuously pushing down on the gas pedal. It was then I realized something. The car was slowing down. Looking at the car in front of us, I saw that it was also slowing down. Damn it! I heard Gabby shout as she exerted all her strength into pushing the gas pedal, hoping the car would suddenly go faster. But it was no use. Both of the cars eventually stopped after a few minutes. The engine wasn't dead and the car was still running, but it wasn't moving. Well, Gabby said, throwing her arms up in defeat and turning to look at me. Someone's got to go out there and fix this damn car. Looking at her eyes, I knew that she meant me. I sighed and prepared to open the car door. Wait! Becky's shrill voice pierced through the walkie-talkie. What? What? Gabby shouted in response, covering her ears as though she expected more loud noises. Remember the third rule. No getting out of the car while on the highway. For heaven's sake, Becky, you seriously brought that bought, <laughs> you seriously bought into that sign? It looked like it was erected about a million years ago, Brian's angry shout echoed in the car. But the whistler But the whistler nothing. It's just a stupid boogeyman story created uh, to scare kids into saying nothing during road trips. There's nothing dangerous about stepping outside. Having had enough, I shot back a reply into the walkie-talkie. You know what, Brian? I'm going to listen to Becky and I'm going to stay inside the car. You can go outside and get your annoying ass eaten by the whistler or whatever it's called. Next to me, Gabby opened her mouth seemingly to protest, but she didn't say anything. Alright, fine. But don't blame me if nothing happens and we end up wasting our time, Brian replied angrily. A few minutes of silence passed. Alright guys, to pass the time, let's play some card games. Silence. Alright, fine. What do you want to play first? Let's play I Spy. I Spy something with my little I beginning with the letter, letter D. I replied, groaning, I replied, desert. You're spying a desert. Correct. Now, Jordan, it's your turn. Sighing, I looked out the window, hoping to find something I could spy. That's when I saw it. Far off in the distance, something was standing in the desert. I couldn't quite make out its features, but I knew for a fact that it was way taller than any actual human. It had a black top hat on, and it was wearing some kind of red suit. I couldn't see its eyes, but I knew that it was looking in our direction. I could vaguely hear some kind of whistling noise coming from that thing. That whistling creature. The Whistler. I'm going to break here for just a second. So, a whistling creature in the woods kind of makes me, you know, from where I'm from, there was, there's apparently a story, and I think it may have been a great uncle of mine that made it, or I don't know, somebody made it up and it was called a Whistling Jack. And that's what I'm thinking, that's what that's making me think of. Anywho, back to the story. What do you think it wants? Becky's frightened voice came out of the receiver. I don't know. Maybe it's an illusion. Brian's voice came out, also trembling. I couldn't say anything. I was just staring at the thing, transfixed. Okay, now we definitely should not get out of the car. Becky said. Okay. Gabby, Brian, and I said in unison. 
as if that was not obvious. We all sat in our cars staring at the whistler. It was whistling a tune. I couldn't quite make out much of the tune, but I knew I'd heard it before either on the street or in a movie. But the whistling sounded unnatural. Hearing it sent chills down my spine and made me even more scared. The whistler didn't seem to move. It just stood in the same spot whistling. It was waiting for us to get out of the car. Anxious, I began repeatedly checking the car lock, confirming that it was indeed locked before I looked at Gabby. She looked paler than usual and she didn't say anything. Well, anything to me at least. As I leaned in close, hoping to comfort her, I heard her mutter something under her breath. I need to get out. I need to get out. I need to get out. I need to get out of the car. Of the car. I was genuinely freaked out then, and I shook her violently, hoping to snap her out of her chanting. She screamed and freaked out as soon as I shook her before she looked at me. Did I... Did I say anything? She said in a small voice. The four of us seemed to be even more on edge after I told Brian and Becky about Gabby's episode. We were scared to go to sleep as we knew that if we did, we could end up uh, risk ending up like Gabby. Gabby became incredibly frightened after I told her what she said, and she clutched my hand tightly. I clutched hers back equally tightly, and all of us just sat in silence for a few minutes. Eventually, I heard Gabby whisper, I'm hungry. I nodded to acknowledge this and reached behind the gra uh, to grab a bag of supplies in the back seat. But they weren't in the back seat. I looked around frantically for the bag until I eventually saw it. For some unknown reason, it was on the road, outside the car. I rolled down the window and tried to reach for it, but it was too far away. The only way to get it was to get out of the car. This was its plan. It wanted to get us out of the car so that it could do something to us. I rolled up the windows and glared at it. It seemed to notice that I wasn't going to get out of the car because the whistling seemed to get louder. It was now very audible, and my ears began to ring from it. Despite this, I refused to get out of the car. After a few minutes, the whistling grew quieter again, and we sat in silence. Gabby's stomach was growling now, but judging from her face, I knew that she also didn't want to leave to get the bag. We sat in the car while the walkie-talkie fell silent as well. It was playing a game with us, and we didn't know how it would end. Eventually, my eyelids began to droop. Ah, not now. Must stay awake, I thought, but it's, it was no use. I eventually drifted off to sleep again. <laughs> Jordan. Jordan, it's over. The thing's gone. Brian's excited voice forced my eyelids to open. I looked around. Indeed, the whistler was gone. We had arrived at the campsite. The bright rays from the sun shone into the car, forcing me to cover my eyes. I breathed a sigh of relief. That thing was finally gone. Come on, Jordan. Get your lazy ass out of the car. Brian was standing outside the car and was next to a pitched up tent. You need to help us set up the camp. Next to him, Gabby and Becky were standing with sticks in their hands. Come on, Jordan, they remarked, smiling. All right, all right, I'm coming. I replied as my hand gripped the car door handle as I prepared to open the car door and step outside the car. Suddenly, a sharp pain erupted in the back of my head as I reeled from the pain. I turned around to see who had hit me. Please don't scare me like that, Gabby's frightened face whispered next to me. I was confused. Gabby was outside. Unless... I looked outside again. The campsite was gone. We were back in the desert. The sky still had the same strange purple hue to it, and that thing was still there. The whistling grew louder again. The whistler was clearly getting more frustrated. I was even more scared now. I checked to make sure the door was locked again. Thank you. I turned to Gabby and whispered. She didn't reply, but she nodded in acknowledgement. We sat in silence again as the whistling grew softer. After a few minutes of silence, the car suddenly echoed with Becky's screams. Get them off of me! Get them off of me! Help me! 
I hurriedly picked up the walkie-talkie and said, Hello? Brian? Becky? Can you hear me? It's all a dream. Don't panic. No response. The screams continued. This time, I could also faintly hear crying coming from the receiver. It sounded as though Becky was in a lot of pain and desperately needed our help. But we couldn't do anything. We could only helplessly hear whatever pain Becky was going through. After a few minutes of screaming, it finally stopped. To our relief, the car on the the car doors on the car in front hadn't opened during the entire ordeal, so we heaved a sigh of relief. We knew that Becky had managed to overcome the nightmare she had and didn't think of getting out of the car. The whistling grew incredibly louder now, as the whistler began to walk closer to us. It looked taller now, and its arms and legs grew more elongated. It was clearly mad now. I looked around the car and looked at the car in front. All of us knew its tricks now. We weren't going to get tricked by... I paused as I remembered Brian. He hadn't been tricked by it yet, and he was the easiest person to trick since he didn't trust anyone other than himself. Almost on cue, Brian's voice came through the walkie-talkie. Guys, the monster's gone. The coast is clear. Woohoo! Looking at the whistler who was coming closer, I, fr I frantically shouted, No, it's a trick. Don't believe it. What are you talking about? What trick? The monster. It's still out there. Jordan, you must be imagining things. I don't see anything. No, it's still there. Listen. When I say it's not there, it's not there. To prove it, I'm going to step outside to show you. No, don't. But it was too late. The car door... <clears throat> the car door open... Uh, the car door on the car in front opened, and we watched as Brian's face emerged from the car. It was over in an instant. As soon as Brian's foot stepped on the concrete road, the whistler stopped whistling and lunged towards him at shockingly fast speed. As it reached him, I saw his expression change from one that was joyful and happy, happy to one that was pure terror. And then he was gone, along with it. The sky lightened and the bright rays of the sun shone down upon us once more. We didn't say anything, even as the car started to move down the highway again. We looked at each other, and we knew one thing. The whistler was real, and it had gotten Brian. A few weeks have passed since Brian's disappearance. As of today, the police are still unable to find his body anywhere, even after interviewing us since we were the last ones to see him. All we said was that he disappeared during our camping trip and we haven't seen him since. We didn't say anything about the Whistler because we knew that they didn't think the Whistler was real and we didn't want to seem crazy. Sometimes I'd like to think we all went crazy during the trip and that there was no such thing as the Whistler, and that we just imagined the whole thing. But I don't think that's the case, because when I go down to the Whistler's highway entrance sign to place my flowers as a way to remember Brian, I can still see his signature on the sign, crossed out. So, that was the Whistler's highway and that was written by the robot I, and that is the robot with an I at the end, not like the robot eyeball, you know. So the robot I, like <laughs> I robot. Um, bonus points if you can spot that obscure movie reference I just made. But uh, let me know what you think of the story. Let me know if you enjoyed it. Uh, follow me on Facebook, FMER Podcast, Instagram, FMER Podcast, Twitter, Full Moon Empty RD, and TikTok, Full Moon Empty Road. Uh, hope you enjoyed, and let me know what you think. Now let's get some rest and keep that fire burning low. <laughs>